your host, Alex Garrett. Indeed, here we are. And uh, if you check out my latest TikTok, Alex G in NYC, uh, I kind of jumped on this trend of ruining friendships. And I'm so in love with New York City, I just hope um, they'd want to ruin our friendship. <laughs> Just kidding. Although, you know, for thousands, they've already ruined friendships, and hopefully we can get those thousands back. But that's how I start tonight's Black Friday uh, podcast, Alex Garrett podcasting. Today, I did not hear, except there was a tragedy of a stabbing, I didn't hear of the bum rushes outside or inside supermarkets today or inside retail stores today for Black Friday sales. I I didn't hear much about that. Did you? Uh, Did you jump on a line for Black Friday? If you did... Alex G in NYC at gmail.com. Alex G I N N Y C at gmail.com. That's also my Twitter, Alex G in NYC. But I didn't hear much of that. And I, I just kept thinking all day about someone who's trying to be a, a company that's trying to be a Black Friday disruptor. Now, as I'm talking, what also comes to mind is, you know, Wall Street hit 30,000 this week. And that is great. But as such a commercialized day today, and as commercialized and as hyped up as it was that we hit 30K on Wall Street uh, this past week, I do not want to tear down capitalism at all. But I just believe we can make capitalism better for the average working class citizen. We should expand the capitalist model and allow people who are the average to compete with the billionaires. Let's make that happen, America. Let's continue to disrupt the the, the 1%, not tear it down, disrupt it, add to it, and bring in some bright minds that are young, that are millennial, that are maybe even a later life in entrepreneurial spirit. And as I said on Facebook last year, we live in sort of a startup economy, right? We have all these startups trying to build, trying to take advantage of Black Friday, like a place called Back Market, which has signs questioning Black Friday, which I think is kind of a disruptor, which is cool. But companies like Black Market, uh, Back Market, B-A-C-K Market, are, are disrupting. And what was, to me, the biggest startup ever? (laughs) It was the American Revolution. Because what that revolution started up was America. And we should be forever grateful that those entrepreneurial, those headstrong founding fathers created this startup called America. And the startups kept on running since 1776. And we look forward to doing, uh, keeping so. But I don't mind talking about disruptors. Like Back Market, who sells refurbished super, they call it the refurbished supermarket for technology, backmarket.com. And uh, I just thought, wow, they're really trying to knock the competition off its feet. And I love it. I think we need more of it. Now, while this holiday has been commercialized, I mean, not, not so much Thanksgiving, though, yeah, com- uh, Thanksgiving, if you don't pay attention, can seem commercialized. I don't think it is entirely. I love our uh I love Thanksgiving. I love our country. And um I'm glad it's not totally commercialized. But in addition to that whole aspect of it. There is another story that brews every time of year and it is one of sadness, depression, a dark time in the winter. While all the lights are out for Christmas, some still face that dark time. But two people I want to bring on tonight that haven't, that have overcome a lot and seen the lighter days ahead. David Marion, who we've met before, and Mr. John Montag, who I remind you has had 87 surgeries and amputee. And he kicks butt now. And they both join me for this podcast. On helping people who cannot quite see the light just yet. Hopefully find some brightness in their in their lives this holiday season. So David and John, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks Alexander for having me on again. Um, you know, hope is an interesting thing. It's a day-by-day thing that we have to work on. 
we get up in the morning, we begin to get grateful for what we have rather than for what we don't have. And as a result, life takes on a new meaning. Once we begin to feel some gratitude um, to wake up another beautiful day, have a chance to start the day, you know, life isn't so much about our successes and accomplishments, but overcoming adversity. We've all had adversity in our life. It's how we deal with it. So um, it's a continual movement forward. It, does this holiday mean something different uh, with your journey? Uh, does this holiday just mean something more special because of what you've gone through? It does. I mean, if you've ever uh, spent Thanksgiving locked up inside a prison, it's, uh, it's a different experience to understand the true nature of the word freedom and what it's like um, to really be able to cook with your family and sit with your family and to sit with friends and people that you appreciate in your life. Uh, rather than have to be with people that you chose not to be with. Uh, David, those are the you circumstances know, of our life. And I'm bringing you on also because we do have thousands of households in America right now struggling with the fact that they have lost a loved one to COVID. But I say we have to keep people mired in belief, not grief. And I think you can help us be that. So how can people still believe, even though they're struggling with their pandemic and possibly a loss of a family member because of the virus? Well, there was a tremendous epidemic prior to the pandemic. And what we're seeing from the pandemic is a tremendous amount of fallout and carnage. And, um, you know, the, the message of hope still resonates that we will get through this. Okay, we get through this the same way we got into it, which is one day at a time, one moment at a time. And this is just for a short time in history. And obviously, we will learn the lessons attached to this later. But at the same time, it still doesn't um, prevent me from being grateful for the small amount of things that I have in my life today, the people attached to me. And, you know, sometimes people just need to say help and reach out and say, I'm hurting. And people are there to help once we do offer that. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think as we hit the darker time in December, I mean, the lights and everything, but for some, it's a darker time. Um, your message of hope is, is going to help people, I think. So thank you for, for that message today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have a friend with you as well. So why don't you introduce us to your friend, uh, John, who has a story of his own as well. I will. I met John through his uh, dad, and uh, we connected a few months ago. Um, John had been through several surg many surgeries and eventually had um, half his leg amputated from the knee down. Um, he played college ball. He's a real good athlete. and. Um, you know, he'll tell you a little bit more about it, but, you know, hooked on pain pills for so many years. And the fact that he's not on pain pills today is nothing short of miraculous. And you talk about a message of hope that if someone can go through this, you know, in the darkest of times, um, there is a great message here that we don't give up and we don't give up on people, that we stay with people. And John's uh, story is one that can really resonate with those who are sitting there today wondering, my God. Can I get through this? So, John, I'll welcome. Thanks John. for thanks for joining us today, and and David, thank you for connecting us. I mean, eighty seven surgeries and amputation, and you're here to see Thanksgiving through it all. Uh, what's this holiday mean to you, and how have you adapted through the years? My, one of my platforms is adapting with Alex Garrett, and I thought adapting you're a perfect example. How, how have you been able to adapt with everything that you've gone through? Uh, for me. It's been a pretty tough one for a long time. My mom died when I was uh, 14. She uh, was an alcoholic and uh, had uh, she needed a, she had jaundice and I can't remember the specific thing where her liver was just shutting down for a long long time, about six or seven years. And uh, yeah, she wouldn't let us. Uh, <laughs> go all black market and get her a new liver. And she said that she had wrecked hers and didn't want to take that from a child. And so it's been really hard because she was the one that, you know, brought us all together. And uh, I mean, my dad's really big into holidays, which is fantastic. And he's the best dad I've ever been around. So, you know, that's, I guess what it means to me is it's just nice to be around him and, uh, you know, get to see what few family members I do have that are around here. John, you've been undergoing 87 
surgeries. I, I can't imagine that. So how has family, how has gratitude even played a role in you uh, getting through all of this? Um, uh, when I, I broke my leg, uh, my tib and my fib, both in two places when I was uh, 18 in the first round of the state tournament as a senior in high school. And uh, I had a, a bunch of uh, D2 baseball scholarships. I could have walked on to like the University of Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota. And uh, the doctor made a mistake and didn't notice I had this uh, thing called compartment syndrome. It's where your muscles can't breathe. And so then I spent 65 days in the hospital as a senior in high school in a row. And uh, I would have uh, failed out of high school, but they didn't do that at private. They just gave me all C's for the quarter. So thank you, uh, private school. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that happened. And then when I was a freshman, I went to a small Catholic school, like a D3. I'm guessing they have some of those where you're, where you're located. Sure. And yeah. a month into school, I got diagnosed with uh, terminal bone cancer. And so I had a baseball, a little bit smaller than a baseball sized tumor on my ribs. So then I had uh, three full years of uh, chemotherapy. Uh, they cut out four of my ribs and half my left lung. And then I continued to have a bunch of surgeries till I was uh, 25. I had had 65 leg surgeries by then. And then they cut off four of my ribs and half my left lung. So, mm -hmm. but that's my medical stuff in a very, very small, uh, breakdown. And it just makes you, um, once you get over being angry mm. and, you know, just being so just distraught that, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't out uh, drunk driving and, you know, hurt my leg really bad and made it so I couldn't play any sports or, you know, live a somewhat normal life in that degree. And you, uh, you know, you just get really mad. And so, you know, I've still been gradually getting over that. I hadn't been, uh, you know, trying to tackle that demon until uh, less than six months ago. Because I, uh, I was just so angry and given I would just push it to the side and not, you know, vent about it or even tell my dad or my few, you know, close friends about it. Cause I know that I didn't think that that would make, uh, make the situation any better, hmm. but you know, now I've just been able to let it go. And so, yeah. Well, that is, uh, that is great that you've been able to move along. I know you've worked with David uh, because, as he mentioned, you were starting to get addicted to painkillers. But um, mainly Thanksgiving for you this holiday, knowing that you're gradually accepting it. Um, well, you know, the, do the holidays cheer you up at all? Like, I guess is one of my questions. Because I know you said oh, your dad's into the holidays. I mean, y yes. But it's not like, uh, uh, not a, to a large degree, you know, I'd be, since uh, the majority of my family is not living in the, this state or the nearby ones. And so we only get together, uh, once every couple of years for like a big, my last name is Montag, as you mentioned, a big Montag family Christmas someplace. And so, you know, I, I get as much enjoyment out of these when it's just our family, when we just, uh, you know, go on a long weekend or just hang out as a family. John, you know, I got to You asked a question. You said, uh, you know, this is a really tough time for people with dealing with any type of addiction, the holidays. It brings up a lot of triggers. It brings up a lot of emotions. Um, and people have a really tough time. Usually when you're around family also, um, there's a lot of buttons that are pushed that normally aren't and it puts them, you know, into action, so to speak. And, you know, not feeling comfortable in the situation and a lot of these old feelings resurface again. So it is a really tough time for most people. Dealing and with so any how type do, of addiction. What, what would your, what would your advice be for those who get uncomfortable? Like what, when you get uncomfortable, say, how do you backtrack and say, okay, I'm not going to fall into this. 
um, I'm just going to stay calm, so to speak. So what I do is I have my cut men, right? I call them my cut men, my spiritual advisors, my sponsors, my mental um, advisors, people in my corner that if I go back, I'm having a bad day. I know how to get out of that moment. I know how to process that to understand um, what's going on. There might be just an obsession that I'm going through. And I know that obsession will eventually dissipate if I do what I'm supposed to do. When you're dealing with addiction, when you're dealing with any type of alcoholism, um, you have to be able to dispense a message on how do we dismember and dismantle the power of the obsession, right? How do we disrupt it? When those thoughts come in your mind to go get high, to go get, you know, to go use, to go gamble, to go eat, whatever it is, there has to be a way to disrupt those thoughts. And there's a lot of processes that I use. And, yeah. No, I'm, there's, you know, whatever it is. Uh, I tell people to carry a rubber band on your wrist and keep popping that rubber band every time that thought comes in. Don't allow that thought to enter your mind. You enter that, that thought enters your mind. It's going to create a mental obsession. And most people with addiction have a physical allergy, which means they don't have a turnoff switch that once they start using, they can't stop. So we have to avoid that. We have David, to I've got to ask you this. <clears throat> when, when, or David and John, when someone says, oh, cheer up, it's the holidays, <laughs> how do you guys react to that? Because it sounds like it, it, what you guys are doing is undercutting this whole, uh, not undercutting, but you're showing a different side to like, hey, people are struggling during this time. And I think it's important to reveal those struggles. But when someone does say like, hey, cheer up, or, you know, it's the holidays, or something, and you may not like that in that moment, how do you react to that? It's a tough time. You know, when people say cheer up, it's the holidays. The holidays have a lot of different meanings to people. You know, when you're riddled with addiction, you just want to get high through the holidays. You don't want to be around for it. And that's a lot of the, you know, we're seeing a lot of these numbers that are staggering today with the amount of drinking and drugging that's going on uh, because of the isolation and loneliness. And people are just trying to get through it. So when you're telling somebody to cheer up, you know, it's kind of like a, um, it's a very, very difficult thing to do, right? It's a no, very it, difficult thing to ask is. somebody to do. Now, you have worked with John, and I know you're very proud of his progress. So tell us a bit about his progress since he started working with you on this, uh, these problems, these addictions. John has come a long way in you know, a very short time. He's, uh, he's had a tough, tough experience life, and you know he's... Um, at the end of the day, I know that John has a lot of gratitude for his family and the people around him. Um, he's in a place right now he didn't want to be, you know, but he is. And he's doing it for a short time. He has a lot of great opportunities in front of him. But right now, what we've been doing is really working on understanding that getting high is not the solution to anything. Because, you know, when we use, we let everyone down around us. We let all the people who really trusted in us, lose the trust, lose the respect. And he's really come a long way on working on doing the next right thing. You know, a guy that's had that many surgeries not to be on pain pills today is nothing short of miraculous. It really, John, it's know, a story that, I know, know there was a little background noise, but I wanted your thoughts on this as well. If you can unmute for a quick second, um, because you are, um, as David said, you, you're an overcomer and I just, it's it's very exciting to hear about that. And as someone who has been an amputee uh, specifically, it wasn't easy and yet you're here today. So explain to us how you've gotten to to this point. Yeah, I mean, the way I guess I got to right now is, um, you know, it's a conscious decision, which is, uh, you know, I, I haven't spent a lot of time around um, addicts other than uh my mother when i was a child who you would never know as a you know 7 to 14 year old you just you know couldn't put that together but uh you know the from what i've heard from dave you know it's a you know everybody's different you know some people can make this decision and as long as they have a support system around them they can say they're done and they're done you know there's no, you know, oh, I'm coming, thinking about coming back. There's none of that as long as they, 
have people around them that they can call that are available to help them, they, uh, they can, you know, it's over. And for me, I've just, uh, even though I ended up going to college when I was, shoot, 24, 25, and I graduated in five years with a business management degree with a minor in finance, uh, I didn't really do a lot with my life. I was very depressed and, you know, it, I just felt like I got a real, real short end of a stick that I didn't even uh, get the opportunity to cut. And uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, the reason that I'm able to be where I am now is, uh, like I had mentioned about my father, uh, my father is the best father of any father that I've ever heard of or spent time around, you know, a guy that runs his own business and, uh, you know, works pretty much all the time still and, you know, loves his job, loves his family, you know, doesn't, I've never seen the man drunk or with a buzz or anything like that in my whole life. And, uh, I just don't need to, as much as I need to do it for myself, you know, I need to get better just to help myself live a better life. But I need He's to never do given it. up on you either, John. Talk about yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, my dad's, uh, out of every surgery I've ever had, other than this thing in Atlanta that I had recently that he uh, went down and talked to the doctor and left, my dad's been there for every surgery I've ever had, was there when I went to sleep, and was there when I woke up. Uh, wow, slept that in is the, amazing. Yeah. That is real He's, fatherhood right there. We live an hour and like 20 minutes from downtown Minneapolis in Mankato, which is like a hundred thousand person town south of Minneapolis. And, uh, he would, uh, you know, he slept in the hospital bed with me for 50 of the, I was there for 65 nights in a row when I broke my leg and two weeks were in Mankato and the rest were in the cities at, uh, um, Minneapolis. And, you know, he slept there in the hospital with me every night other than one. You know, the one night his wife slept there. And, uh, yeah, he'd drive up early in the morning to beat before traffic. And, yeah, that's just who he is. He's a absolutely fantastic human being. And uh, I'm the oldest in my family. And so, you know, that's what it was. And. My brother had still drove up a couple of times because it's not like he, he just had nothing to do, but, or not nothing to do, but he, you know, that's what he felt like he needed to do for his child. And uh, he wasn't, he couldn't have been more right. And guys, your story, yeah. John, your so, story is so fascinating. And I want to have you guys on for another uh, like part of the series. So come back. Um, we're running a bit low here on time, but I want. Oh, you to sorry about that. No, 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 not on you. It just, it just perfect the way it's going to be. So, if you guys come back on Saturday, I would love to have you back to talk more about this because your story. But for, for today, for the, for the initial conversation starter for the weekend, um, how, what's your message for those who may not find joy right now? But how do you assure them that yeah, you've been there? There is joy somewhere around the corner. How can you uh, assure those assure people today? Uh, my I message for everybody. Day. Okay. Uh, my message for everybody would be, yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are times where it looks so bad that, you know, I mean, I've contemplated suicide. I've never like sat there with a gun or, you know, poured out a bunch of pills that I might take, but I've, I've thought about it. And, you know, I just never had the, I don't know, the, to actually do it. I didn't, I couldn't do that, put my family through it more than kill myself for me. And, you know, people just need to come to that conclusion. They need to, you know, spend some time about reevaluate their situation. And that's what they want to do. But you need to know that the world isn't going to be a better place without you in it. So that's. That's what I'd tell people. Yeah, I think it's um, 
Go ahead, Alex. Are you going to? And David, your thoughts on, on this and how you can assure people there are lights uh, at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, you know, it's just going through that tunnel. And when we go through that tunnel, I say it's, you know, what we go through is uh, infinitely wide yet finite in distance, right? Meaning that we have to go through this and it's really a smelly place at times to go through, but there's a beginning, a middle and an end. And you have to know the process where you are. And when you're in it, it stinks. It doesn't feel good, but you get to see that light at the end of the tunnel and you know, you're on the right path. And eventually if you do the right thing and you do what you're supposed to do, that path will illuminate and it becomes a lot easier to continue to live your life because we resist a lot of the changes in our life. And I often say resistance is greater than the actual change. And as soon as we just do it and make that decision not to get high, not to do this, to be grateful today, life takes on a new meaning. I'm very thankful that you guys want to tell your story, part of it today. Please come back. I, I'm hoping to talk with you Saturday and we can uh, really delve into this a little more. Um, but I want you guys to enjoy your Thanksgiving and uh, enjoy it with the families. And we will talk to you soon over the weekend. And David, Thanks so very welcome. much for your time. Uh, talking with you. David, where can we contact you? Because I know you got your book out. I know you got a website. David at theliferecoverycoach.com. Uh, the website is theliferecoverycoach.com. The book is Addiction, Addiction Rescue, The No BS Guide to Recovery, written with my ex-wife, Dana Golden. That's David Marion and Dana myself. Golden. That's yeah. an amazing story. We have itself. another book coming out um, early next year, too. Well, David, thanks for always staying in touch. Awesome. And we, will, we will talk to you soon. Absolutely. I'm Alex Garrett. Indeed, stay tuned to this podcast for uh, every episode. Alex G in NYC on Twitter. Alex G in NYC dot net. Have a great Thanksgiving weekend. We'll talk to you soon.